so we can give them again we say grace and peace to everybody we're glad you're with us this uh word empowerment bible study on this tuesday night we have been having an awesome time with this series the god chasers by tommy tenney as always i have to say that we are using excerpts from his book so whenever we quote something different we won't have to hear anyone say you misquoted his book amen so we give credit but we're adding to it good to see minister bonnie and for others that we cannot see on our feed tonight we are going to chapter four which is on page 51 for those who have the book i think i have the original not quite sure what page the new one is on <clears throat> but as I say, our chapter is, I need to stop that music. As I say, our, our, the chapter is Dead Men, Dead Men, help me, Father. Dead, dead Men See His Face. And I know most of the time when people hear the word day, they, they, they think, well, I've got to die to see God's face. I'm here to tell you, you can see his face right here, right now, but you got to die to yourself. Let me rephrase it. We got to die to ourselves. Amen. So often people don't want to die. You all right, Pastor Vicki? I just said we, we got to die to our flesh. <laughs> yeah, we got to die to our flesh. That's what I mean. Yes. We literally got to have to die to our flesh. And a lot of times people don't want to die to their flesh. Y'all know that, right? I want what I want when I want it, how I want it. But if we really want to see God's face, if we really want to be in his presence, the subtopic of this one is the secret path to his presence. So if we really want to see his face, if we really want to get into his presence, we got to die to ourselves. And I know sometimes that's hard, but let's make sure we get there. Amen. I remember a time when my flesh was rising and I could never get in God's presence, but I've learned how to die to my flesh. And you say most of the time you got to ask him to help you die to your flesh. Okay, because if we ourselves, we won't ever do it because we get comfortable. Amen. Amen. Yes, Pastor Vicky did most of the prayer, and I'm going to start us off. <clears throat> Listen, we're, as I said, we dead men see his face. Chapter four, the secret path to his presence. Amen. It starts out saying, I know it's here somewhere. I can tell I'm close. Y'all hear that? I can tell I'm close. There has got to be a way to get in there. Oh, there is. there it is. The path doesn't look really nice, though it doesn't look really nice. In fact, it's kind of broken and bloody. Let's see what they call this path. Repentance, which we talked about repentance last week. Repentance. Are you sure this is the way? Are you sure this is how I can reach my goal of his face and his presence? I'm going to ask a fellow traveler, Moses, what do you say? You've been there. Tell me. And it goes on to say, and it's coming from Exodus 33, verse 17 through 18 and verse 20. And the Lord said unto Moses, I would do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast has found grace in my sight and I know thee by name and he said I beseech thee show me your glory and he said thou canst not see my face this is God saying thou can you cannot see my face for there shall no man see me and live that's again that's Exodus 33 when Moses asked God to show him his glory the Lord warned him that no man can see him and live. Mm. Good God Almighty. Most people will look at that and say, you mean as soon as I see you, God, I'm going to die. No. Listen, we won't live. We won't live anymore the same way in our flesh. Y'all better catch that, okay? Um, even in the new covenant, this statement is true. Only dead men can see God. There is a connection between his glory and our death. Mm. When Moses began to press the case with God and said, I want to, I've got to. Uh, Moses already had the outline of the tabernacle. He was the man God chose to receive the architectural details of the pre-Calvary model of salvation and man's ultimate restoration to his presence. Look, it says, I am positive that Moses looked at the tabernacle and 
looked at the tabernacle and law and thought, this is not really it. This is just some sort of model of what God is going to do. It's only a type, a shadow. We heard that uh, Resurrection Sunday morning at sunrise service. I think he knew that the furniture and utensils of the tabernacle all had symbols meaning he wanted to see the finished product. This man started a cathedral that was too big to build in one generation. So he said, show me your glory. Mm. This was when the Lord said, you can't. Only dead men can see my face. Come on, if I just stop right there for a moment. You can't see his glory. Only dead men can see his face. Come on, how many really want to see him? That just reminded me, somebody remind me to take that tabernacle replica that I've got in my prayer room to church. <laughs> Amen. Only dead men can see his face. Anybody want to comment on that? Anything that I just read? Okay, moving on. Look, it also says, that's why I love to read about the visionary prayers of people like and me, Simple McPherson and William Seymour, y'all pray for me, who used to stick his head in an apple crate doing all night prayer meeting on Azusa Street and pray for the glory of God to come down. Good God Almighty, when was the last time somebody prayed for the glory of God to come down? Mm. He said, I believe that when the congl conglomerate prayers of God's people gather together and finally reach a crescendo of power, hunger, and intimacy, it finally gets to be too much for God to delay any longer. At that point, he finally says, that's it. I won't wait any longer. It's, it is time. God is saying, when we cry out to him, then he'll move. I hear what I just said. If, if anybody know anything about the people on Azusa Street, when they had that revival, they cried out, good God of mine, and they said it was such a powerful revival that went on at that time. What about us? He says, anybody going to come in? I'm sorry. So this Azusa Street incident is a, a true a true yes. incident that actually happened? Yes, yes. Carlton Pearson wrote some of his greatest songs for that and during that time. Yes, ma'am. Y'all read about it. Please read about Azusa Street. Mm, 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 revival. Um, that is what happened in Argentina in the 1950s. A man named Edward, a man named Edward Miller wrote a book entitled Cry for Me, Argentina, in which he described one of the origins of the great revival in Argentina that was distinct, that was destined to impact South Africa and ultimately the entire world. Dr. Miller is now in his 80s, but more than four decades earlier, this book's been written a while, y'all, more than four decades earlier, he was one of but a few Pentecostal or full gospel missionaries working in Argentina. He tells the story of how 50 students in his Argentina Bible Institute began to pray and had an angelic visitation. They had to suspend classes because of the heavy prayer, burden, prayer burdens they had for the nation of Argentina. Day after day, for 49 days in a row, these students prayed and interceded for Argentina. In this Bible school, Argentina was a spiritual wasteland at the time, as far as Dr. Miller knew. He said he only knew of 600 spirit-filled mm, believers in the entire nation during those years under the government of Juan Perón. But did y'all catch what he said? They said they pray all day, every day for 40, for 50 days. You can't even get people to pay for five days now. I mean, I talk to a lot, a lot of different pastors and I say, hey, I want to I wanna do a prayer thing. Let's get together with our people and your people and everybody, everybody choose a day or an hour. It used to be every hour and just pray. Couldn't get enough people to pray for the 21 days. That's not good. I mean, I know we pray during the 21 day fast, but can you imagine what would happen if we all could get on one accord and pray? Not, and hear what I'm about to say, not pray no fleshly prayers. Forget about your stuff, because see, when you pray for the nation, God will deal with yours. 
I don't hear what I just said. So often, God is me. This is what happened. This is no. Let's pray for deliverance. Let's pray for wholeness. Let's pray for God to break down some stuff, tear down some stuff. Anybody want to quickly comment on anything I just said or read? You know, I was talking to God this morning on the way to work. Um, and I was talking about talking to God about how, you know, we used to have shut ins years ago. Yes. And we used to be there all night long until we we got a word from the Lord. Yes. But I think a lot of ministries has gotten away from shut-ins now. Nobody does it anymore. Yes. I remember not the last one that we had, but I remember one of the bigger ones that I had gone to um, before I picked the ministry back up here in Fayetteville. And, and, and they said, you don't need pillows. Nobody went to sleep. You hear me? We prayed. We shouted. We worshiped. Literally, people were slayed out. And it was all night. Now we do to 12 midnight and some folks bring their pillows then and they say, wake me up when it's over. No, we got to get back to that. Y'all hear me? And not for show, but for sometimes for God to move. Anybody else want to comment? I'm at the bottom of 52. Dr. Miller told me that he that he had never seen people weep so hard and so long in prayer. I'm going to stop right there. Can y'all imagine when people get out of their flesh and they cry tremendously and, and they don't worry about nothing else? Why is it that some people can't cry? Why is it that they can't weep before the Lord? Why is it that they're sitting around with a half a tissue? Sometimes you got to forget the tissue. You just got to weep. What's the right word I want to use? Violently. Anybody want to comment? When was the last time you cried like that? Hmm. Come on, y'all. We, we, this is not a judgment question, but we got to get to that place. You don't have to be in church to do it, but don't cry just because you got an issue. Don't cry just because there's a problem. Forget all of that. How about we weep before the Lord and watch what he will do? Amen. Anybody want to come in? Because I'm excited. I don't even know where I was. Um, okay, it had to be supernatural in origin and purpose. We don't know what about, I'm sorry, we don't know much about inter interceding today. Many of us think it consists of screaming against evil. Y'all better hear this evil spirits, but that's not what needs to happen. We simply need to, need Father to show up. I, I said recently, we were talking about somebody that always talks about demons. If she, if this person just asked God to show up, but not just her, just people in general, instead of complaining, God, we just need you to show up in this place. God, we need you to manifest yourself in this place. Not give us stuff, but manifest your presence in this place. Come on, only dead men will see his face. Anybody want to comment? When you asked the question about uh, earlier about um, why people don't cry, I think pride gets in the way sometimes. Yes. And then sometimes say, well, I don't know how to pray, but praying is just like you and I talking, all, us talking right now. That's that's yes. that's how we talk to God. We don't have to pray like, you know, some people where they are, you know, uh, they've been praying for a long time so they um, can flow with it. It yes. doesn't matter about the flow as long as it's flowing from the heart. That's all yes. that God is asking for. So all God is looking for us to do is to come to him humble. Yes. Come to him humble and come to him with with the, a clean heart, knowing and seek, knowing that we want more and seeking him even the more. And but I think a, a lot of times I just see where pride just gets in the way and people don't even want to open their mouths because they so focus on who's watching, who who's who's looking. Mm -hmm. But God sees, and that's the only person we need to be focused on at that time. But it's sad, even in people's homes nowadays, it's all about a lot of times it's about complaining. And even if you don't pray, just weep before the Lord. Cry out to God. God deliver. Find scriptures on deliverance. God, this is what I need you to do. Deliver, God. Deliver. Deliver me from myself, God. Teach me, God. Baptize me in the Holy Ghost. God, help me to know you. It's not even about praying I did for this and that. Ask God to, to, to really, truly baptize you in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues so you can have the power from on high that we need to be able to get a breakthrough when we go through. Y'all all right? Anybody want to come in? 
I know I get excited, but I got to. It's all oh, right. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Vicki. It could only be described as unearthly weeping. See, see, some people cry, but that ain't weeping. Do y'all remember? I know Pastor Womack remember. Y'all remember the weeping corner where the weeping mothers got together and they just wept and, and they moaned, you know, and, and, and you didn't know what they were moaning about, but it, it was something in that moan that just, whoo, could God them and it shifted. It made the whole room shake. We got to get back to the, mm, 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 Lord, do it. Mama, mama, do it for me, Lord, right now. Let me move on because I done got excited. And that's what I be doing in my house. I be walking around this house, Lord, do it. Good God Almighty. Woo, and all of a sudden, it's like I feel his presence all around. Uh, let me, anyway, it could only be described as an unearthly weeping. Somebody just say, Lord, do it. Lord, do it. Take your mutes off. It's okay. If you have a lot of talking or stuff behind you, then you just put the mute back on. I don't want folks to think I'm up here by myself. Amen? Amen. Now y'all say, Lord, do it. Lord, do Lord, it. Do it. Lord, do it. Lord, do it. time like you mean it. Lord, do it. Lord, Lord do, do it. it. Thank you, Jesus. Ah, do it, do it. Do it, Lord. Mm. Dr. Miller told me that those students Lord. wept and cried day after day. He mentioned that one young man uh, leaned, leaned his head against the concrete brick wall and wept until after four hours and look at this and trail and, and a trail of tears had run down the Porsche, the, the porous wall. Mm. Mm -hmm. After six hours had passed, he was standing in a puddle of his own tears. I told you all one time when I was upstairs in my study, I just moved here. And I said, Lord, I want to get rebaptized. And it's like Jesus himself ushered me in the water and I began to cry and weep. And he baptized me. My whole floor was wet. I don't know if it was my tears or it was just the water from what he did for me. Y'all hear what I said? Nothing mm -hmm. leaked through the floor, but my whole carpet was wet in that one spot. Come on, come on, y'all got this. Oh my God, I can't explain it to you. Six hours, six hours, we have no spot. Okay, these these young intercessors wept day after day, and and he said it could only be described as an unearthly weeping. These students weren't simply repenting for something they had done. They had been moved by the spirit into something called vicarious repentance in which they began to repent for what had happened, excuse me, for what had happened through others in their city, their regions, and in the country of Argentina. I don't know about y'all, I I begin, I, a couple of weeks ago, I started saying, Lord, I'm repenting for this country. God, I'm repenting for how they have allowed you to be taken out of school. Y'all hear what I'm saying? God, I repent for this nation. Uh, glory to God. Anybody, okay, anybody want to comment before I go on? Mm. Dr. Miller said that one of the mm -hmm. 50th day, on, on the 50th day of continuous intercession and weeping before the Lord, a prophetic word came forth that declared, weep no more, for the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed over the prince of Argentina. 18 months later, Argentina's Argentinians were flocking to evangelistic healing services in soccer stadiums that seated 180,000 people. And even the largest stadiums in the nation weren't big enough to contain the crowds. Good to see you, Sister Emma. Did y'all catch that? Because they they repented for the nation before they because they prayed for the nation, because they wept before the Lord for the nation. The nation was turned. The nation began to cry out. The nation began to run to healing services and prophetic services. The nation had been turned and changed. What's happening in the USA, y'all? I'm just saying, what's happening? We've got to get back to praying. We've got to get back to getting to a place where we got to die in our flesh so that we can cry out to God for this country, this nation. So many people are saying the USA is, 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 is dying. There's no good anymore. Well, guess what? We got to cry out to God. Come on. You can't say, well, I'll wait for that people, those people to do it. No, we have a part to play. Come on, let's become dead men so we can see God's face so that we can cry out and God will turn some things around. 
Anybody want to put a comment? Comments. Even those of you on Facebook, please feel free to comment. Can you imagine what would happen if the people of God came together and one on one accord and one location cried out before the nation? Yes. That would be that would be a tremendous change. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. So let's not wait for others to do it. How about we just begin to do it? Let's just prepare mm -hmm. something and we decide, you know what? We're going to take 30 days or whatever and we're just going to cry out before the Lord. Now, some people might say, I can't do that and go to work. Yes, you can. I can't mm -hmm. do that and do all I got to do. Yes, you can. I pray 24-7. You don't have to get loud and outrageous. I see people walking down the street looking like they about to fall over. I start praying for the nation because I'm praying for them because they're in this thing with us. Okay, uh, anybody else want to comment on what was said or what was read? No, y'all good. Let's move on then. He, he says, I'll, he said, I'll never forget what he told me. If God can get enough people in an area to reject the, y'all catch the rulership and the dominion of Satan. Ah, uh, when I first moved to Fayetteville, they kept saying Fat Fayetteville has some satanic stuff going on. In my mind, I'm like, wait a minute. Well, who's been not, who has not been praying? Because you can change some things in that area that you're in. I know Satan has different territories, but it doesn't matter what territory you're in. You can pray that stuff down. The mm -hmm. problem is people say it and they see it, but they don't do anything about it. Let me move on. Where am I? If enough of his people will reject Satan's dominion in the right way with humility, with brokenness, and in repentance, intercession, then God will slap, look at this, an eviction notice on the doorway of the ruling demonic power of that area. And when he does, then there is a light and glory that begins to come. Listen, someone says everything in California, everything in D.C., everything in New York is demonic. Well, there are safe, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled people there too. Somebody need to start praying. People keep saying they're ruling the White House where people need to start praying. That's why I said I can't stay where I am because I tell people if you don't vote, don't talk. But when you know that it's time for voting, you need to pray, pull a sample ballot, look up everybody on that ballot, see what they stand for, and then ask God who it is that you need to be praying, who you need to be voting for. Amen. Stuff will change when we change. Y'all say amen. Anybody want to comment on what I just said? I'm not getting political. I'm just saying we got to, people got to, I can't say we because I'm not in it. People got to stop complaining about what's going on in D.C. if they're not praying and, and, and fasting about it. Let me move on. If God can get enough people in an area to reject the rulership, I already read that, didn't I? Okay. We are, I'm on page 53. For those who just joined us, we are talking about the God, we're on the God Chaser series. And tonight we are on Dead Men See His, See His Face. We are really praying for an open opening in the heavens over our cities and our nations so that when the glory of God comes, the people in the area can resist, can't resist anymore because of that. Look, because of the stronghold of demonic powers, because of the strongholds of demonic power will be broken. How does that happen? It happens through a visitation of the manifestation of the glory of God. All that, uh, all that prayers would arise that would both close the gates of hell and open the windows of heaven. Listen, I told you uh, uh, yesterday morning when we had our morning glory prayer at 6 a.m., I woke up, all I kept hearing the Spirit of the Lord say, because I still reign. We are standing under an open heaven. People say that all the time. But if you don't really truly believe that you're standing under an open heaven and God wants to do all of these things and he wants to rain down on us, he wants to change some things and, and destroy some stuff. Come on, y'all better wake up and understand that. Anybody want to come in? Because he will open up the windows of heaven. People always say, pour me out a blessing. I won't have room to receive. He will open up the heavens and bring down look uh chastisement against the enemy and destroy some stuff too anybody want to comment on what i just read or said talk to but him but when he but when he destroys some stuff that's a blessing right there by itself yes it doesn't have to be a blessing that's tangible one that you can see Thank but knowing you. that he's destroying some stuff that's a blessing all by itself yes because mm -hmm. once he destroyed those demonic things uh things that's happening then guess what then you will be able to see the blessings even the more 
Amen. Amen. Anybody else want to comment? I'm just excited. Y'all know me. I just get excited. Anybody else? Nope. Okay. You ready uh, for me to take over? Yep. Yeah, just be ready to halt. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next section is we like to dance around burning bushes. Hmm. One, one of our problems is that whenever we have good services or feel like revival has come, we tend to camp out at that spot and pull aside from our pursuit of God so we can dance around the burning bushes. We get so caught up in what happened at the bush that we never go back to Egypt and set the people free. God is telling his church that it's enough just to be blessed. It's uh -huh. not enough to receive his gifts and walk in his anointing. I don't want more blessings. I want the blesser. I don't want any more gifts. I want the giver. Are you saying you don't believe in gifts that you don't want God's blessing? No, I'm saying that sometimes in our emotional frenzy over seeing something from the other world, briefly visit this world, we get overwhelmed and distracted from our divine purpose. Don't just get excited about the toys that God has. He wants you to be excited about him. My ministry requires me to travel quite often. And when I come home to my family, I don't get too excited when I'm um, peppered with questions by my children. What did you bring me, Daddy? Did you get me anything? I realize that is normal for little children. But what I really want, what I dreamed about almost every day I'm, I'm away, is the moment my six-year-old just crawls up in my lap and loves on me with no thoughts about what toy I've tucked into my suitcase. I think that's what my children will remember years from now too. Decades after the toys and trinkets have disappeared in a dump somewhere, Father God wishes for the same thing. Not chases won't God. Not even the things of God will satisfy someone who is a man after God's own heart. See Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Most of the time when we get a visitation from God, our eyes are on the wrong thing. We want his spiritual toys. We tell him, touch me, bless me, Father. And we have managed to turn on local churches into bless me clubs. Nowhere in the Bible is the altar the place of blessings. An altar exists for only one thing. Just ask that that little lamb that was brought to the altar. This is not a place of blessings. It is a place of death. But if we can embrace that death, then perhaps we can see God's face. Amen. I wanted you to go on and finish. I'm going to go back up to that first paragraph and we like to dance around the burning bush. It says one of our problems is that whenever we have... We, and whenever we have a good service or revival, we want revival to come. People tend to camp out at that same spot. Y'all ever seen people that, that go to revival and for a whole month, they talking about the revival, but it goes on to say, look, but they, they stop their pursuit of God. You can't stop your pursuit of God just because you had a revival or you had a moment with God, you have to pursue God constantly. Y'all remember that, that, that movie that, that I think, I can't remember the guy's name, Will Smith is in, The Pursuit of Happiness. And he did everything he could to, to find happiness, to take care of his child. Why can't we have that same pursuit of God like that? He didn't care what was stolen, what was taken. He just still went on and did something did it another way until he reached that goal. We can't just have a revival or a moment with God in one service and you stop looking for God, look, look, trying to get in his presence. Because we don't have to look for him. He's always there. But if we don't die to our flesh, you won't even know his presence is there. That's the saddest part. And it goes on to say, uh, we can dance around a, a, a burning bush, but what happens when the fire go out? I'm just paraphrasing. What happens when the fire go out? How are you going to rekindle the fire? The fire should never go out. The flicker should never go out. Y'all hear what I'm saying? The revival of your heart should never go out. Somebody just say, revive me, oh Lord, because the revival should, in our heart should never go out. Amen. 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 And, uh, let me do this last part and y'all can just, anybody can just comment on what I said or what she read. It says, Mo, I'm at the bottom. Most of the time when we get a visitation from God, our eyes are on the wrong thing. We want his spiritual toys. We talked about that earlier. We tell him, touch me, bless me, Father. And, and we have looked at this, managed to turn our local churches into a bless me club. 
Folks used to tell us all the time, I can't come to Healing Hands. I need to go to a church because that talks about prosperity. We are a healing and deliverance ministry. You will get the prosperity when you get healed and delivered. Why would you want the things of God and you can't enjoy the things of God? I know what I just said. It says nowhere in the Bible is the altar the place of blessings. The altar exists only for one thing. Come on, we got to get before the Father. Come on, anybody want to comment on what she read or what I just said? Again, I said, you know, mm -hmm. I was just thinking about that, um, that T-shirt that people give their kids, you know, the one that says my, my parents went to blah, blah, blah. And all I got was the stinking T-shirt. Oh, I never saw, heard that, but go ahead. You never, you never come on now. Y'all know y'all have seen those T-shirts. And, and, and I thought about that because they should be excited by the fact that their parents arrive home safely, their parents are back, you know, there with them so that they can continue to fellowship and, you know, love on their parents and not be so concerned about the t-shirts. And I guess, I mean, not so concerned about the toys or the gifts that their parents would, a parent would typically get their child. And I think that's kind of what he was saying. When we're dealing with God, we shouldn't be worried about what God has given us. We should just be worried about the fact that God is still with us and that God is still there for us to be able to tap into whenever we need him. Yes, but think about this. Until people die to their flesh, they will always think about what he can give them because they won't be looking for him. I tell people, don't look for his hand, look for his presence. Y'all get what I'm saying? I mean, look for his presence, not the things. Anybody just want to comment on what she read or anything we said? And good to see you, daughter. Well, we have to be mm -hmm. willing to die. And too many of us are not willing to die. What we want to be told is that everything we do was wonderful. And we, um, when we pray, we ask God, to fill us with his Holy Spirit. But that means that there are things about us that have to die. Mm -hmm. We must be prone. Yes, yes. You know, I told somebody once before, people have to die to their flesh. And the person said, die? If I died, I can't talk. But sometimes God don't want you to talk. He wants you to weep and cry out before him. Sometimes we talk too much. God don't want to hear all of that. He wants us to say, God, I'm thankful for your grace. I'm thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your love, God. Deliver me, God. I repent, God. Kill me. Kill my flesh, Lord. Because you know what? When your flesh burns, it stinks, don't it? And sometimes God got to kill our flesh and burn our flesh because sometimes it becomes a stench in his nostrils. So he got to kill off some stuff. So when we get in his presence, we, we, we don't have that stench of sin, that stench of complaining, that stench of all of that other stuff. Okay, pull me, all of that stuff. God don't want to hear none of that. Anyhow, anybody want to comment before she reads, why are you talking about death so much? And we're probably going to, yeah, we'll see if we can get to the next one. I'm a walking dead man. Yes, Lord. Mm. Okay. I'm talking about the New Testament equivalent of death which is repentance, brokenness, and humility before the Lord. Too many times we are giving lip service to God's word. We say it is true, but we act like it isn't. What if God meant what he said? What if it's true that only dead men see his face? We are too easily satisfied with things that are not quite what they ought to be. I'm pressing my point because the church is, a great, is in grave danger of once again stopping at the burning bush mm. in this wonderful visitation of God's presence. There is a greater purpose behind the meetings taking place around the world, and it isn't just for us to get blessed. God wants to break open the heavens over our cities so that the people who are within God will know that without he is God. Lord and that he loves them. Hey, without God, I had to stop you on that one. People who are without God, God wants to break open the heavens over our city so that people who are without God, I'm sorry, That's will okay. know that he is Lord and that he loves them. Now that, now that is the true purpose of God's visitation amongst men. 
We need to get our eyes off the toys and onto the purpose. Like Moses, we need to cry out, no, thank you, Lord. No, thank you, Lord. That's not enough. We want more. We've got to see more. We want to see your glory. We don't want to see just where you have been. We want to see where you are going. That is where we must stand calling for God to show us where he's going to break open the heaven over our cities. That is what I'm looking for. I just want to find out where he's going so I can position myself at the place where he is going to break open. There is an element of sovereignty in God's choice of places. Nobody on earth strikes the match for burning bushes. Only God can do that. Our part consists of wandering through the wilderness until we find that spot and then to remember to take off our shoes because we've stumbled onto holy ground. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about two things. Going back up to that top part, it says um, in the New Testament, equivalent to, of death, which is repentance, brokenness, and humility before the Lord. You Don't you know a lot of people don't want God to break them? Because they think if God broke them, they won't survive. Trust me, when God does the breaking, we will survive. There's a song that says gracefully broken. Sometimes God has, God has to gracefully break us from the norm, from ourselves. He has to, you need to start saying, God, gracefully break me. Break me, Lord, so that I can walk in repentance and humility, so that God, I can, don't have to just give you lip service, but I can be in your presence. Um, and then the part that talks about, um, like Moses, we need to cry out, no, thank you, Lord. That's not enough. I can't speak for you, but I'm not satisfied. I love William Murphy, not William Murphy. William McDowell has a song that talks about I'm not satisfied. And I play this one song all the time. I can't, this young lady from Africa, we pray for more. You got to start saying, God, I am not satisfied. I tell God that all the time, Lord, I am not satisfied. I am not satisfied. It's not a building. I am not satisfied. Somebody said, you mean you all left that big 8,000 square foot building? Well, that was just a building. The building doesn't make God. It doesn't make us. I'm not satisfied. William William McDowell said, I'm not satisfied. I got to have more. So if I got to come outside of a building to get the more, come on, because I, you know, I'm not going to ask you all because I don't want to put anybody on the spot, whether you hear or whether those that may that are on Facebook or whether those that may see it later on our YouTube channel. If I ask people right now, have you ever been so gracefully broken by God that you cried out, God, I'm not satisfied? Or have you been in a place where you've never ever really had an experience with God? That's something to think about. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but if you've never had an experience with God, hit me up here, send me a text so I can be praying for you. Nobody will have to know, but I sure wouldn't be, I sure wouldn't be ashamed of who found out. Because when you want something from God, you won't. It won't matter who knows. That's right. Like someone said recently, and I know we need to move on. Someone said recently, um, every time you say something about who needs, who wants to be filled with the Holy Ghost, some people say I, I get afraid to go up there because I don't want people to know I don't speak in tongues. Well, you just gave the devil so much power. Mm -hmm. Get about what people think. How bad do you want it? Are you satisfied with where you are? Or do you want more? Oh, my Lord. Um, are we going to be able to get to, I can almost smell the singed fragrance. We're going to start. Yeah, okay, let's, let's, let's go. Anybody want to comment on what was just read? I'm so sorry. Okay, let's see if we can make it. Sometimes I visit places where I can almost smell the singed fragrance of leaves that don't burn. It makes me it makes me sense that we're near the place where God is going to give us an SQ S encapsulated vision of the greater purpose behind all this. Most of what we have seen so far is the renewal of the church. I'm thinking that revival is not the best word for what we are seeing because it refers to something that is dead being brought back to life. I don't have the terminology to describe what God is about to do. How do you describe a tsunami? How do you describe a tidal wave? How do you talk about what God can do along with the unspeakable grace and the strength that comes with it? The biblical model I desire and dream of is God's dealing with the city of Nivea. I want to see a wave of God 
sweep through a city, pushing before it all the all of man's arrogance while leaving behind it nothing but a trail of broken repentance. I'm hungry for a revival like we see in Jonah's description of citywide repentance and fasting in Nivea. What kind of revival should have happened at, at Nazareth, but it didn't. Nazareth would have been the optimal place because that city had the greatest preacher who ever lived. Jesus stood in Nazarene uh, synagogue and said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Then he ran from the menu of what he wanted to do. Heal the sick, open the blind eyes, set the prisoners free, but he wasn't able to do any of it because of the unbelief of the people in Nazareth. We need to pay attention to this sad story because Nazareth was the Bible belt in Jesus' day. Nazareth was a place where it should have happened. You cannot go by the outward appearance of a place or people. I don't care what a thing or a person looks like. Only God knows his plans for the future. Many Christians have written off major metropolitan cities such as Los Angeles, New York, Detroit, Chicago, or Houston. Los Angeles may be the home of thousands of pornographic places in the Hollywood film industry, but Nivea was an even more unlikely place for revival in its day. To say nothing of Shanghai, New Delhi, Calcutta, Rio, Janeiro, and the list grows, but if someone can find the light switch, his glory will flood these cities. It must because he said that the glory of God will over will cover the earth. See Numbers chapter 14, verse 21. Okay, I just got two things on this. Jonah's mindset, he did not want to go to Nineveh because he didn't want the people delivered. And so often, so often when we look at a place, Nineveh, the people in Nineveh had to be delivered in order for others to get delivered. In order for people around us to get delivered, we got to get delivered. But I got to go back up to this top. I can almost smell the sin fragrance. Have you ever got so close, but yet so been so far away? You can see God burning off some stuff, changing some stuff, but yet in reality, you were still so far away. Anybody ever been there besides me? God, I got so close, but it seemed like I can't get all the way there. He said, I can almost smell the sin fragrance. God don't want, we don't, God don't, we don't want God to get to a place where he can almost smell the burning of our flesh. He wants to smell the sweet aroma of our flesh just being destroyed so that only he can, can rise up in us. So we got to get to a place because just as like in the natural, you can, you can see someone, you say, oh, they're almost there. I wonder what happened. Why didn't they just press a little bit harder? Why didn't they just draw, why didn't they just draw just a little bit closer? Y'all ever seen people like that? Why didn't they just draw just a little bit closer? Why did they just give up? You know what I'm saying? They almost got in God's presence, but church services is, is, is what preach one hour. Well, service is two hours most of the time, but they only hear one hour of the word. And, and then sometimes people cut it off and, and, and they might need, like Apostle Ford said, um, six o'clock um, resurrection Sunday morning. So many people have gotten away from altar call. They've gotten away from pressing in. I don't care what nobody say. I, I, I can take time for the people. As long as I got somebody there at that altar with me to help me to keep praying. Because we can't, we can't get to a place where we're almost smelling the, the, the singe of our bodies. We want to be able to smell the death. Because don't y'all know dead people smell? Mm -hmm. But the next part talks about I'm a walking dead man. That's how we got to get to. And hopefully we're going to get, anybody want to comment on what, what, what she just read or what I said? Because we're going to stop after we do I'm a, I'm a walking dead man. Anybody want to comment? Can you smell your, 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 your sinful flesh, and I'm not talking natural flesh. Can you still smell your sinful flesh and know that God still want to burn some more off? Am I getting too strong tonight, y'all? I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Nope. Okay. You're good. I'm a walking dead man. <laughs> Only dead men see God's face. So when you go behind that veil, you have to say, I'm really not alive anymore. I'm a walking dead man. When a condemned man begins his final walk to the death chamber, mm -hmm. just before they close the door of the corridor, the warden or one of the chief guards will often shout through the hall, dead mm -hmm. man walking. This is to let everyone know that a man is spending his last few moments of life on this earth and that they are to be still and honorable. The man is alive, but only for a few moments. When he gets to the death chamber, it's all over. That is how the Christian lives um, lives out Romans 
12, verse 1, a dead man walking. Hmm. The high priest of old knew that he was a dead man walking. When the other priest tied a rope around his ankle while he looked at the heavy veil separating him from the Holy of Holies, the only way he would ever walk out of that room alive was solely by the mercy and grace of God. We don't understand the delicate matters of approaching the glory of God today. We talk about the glory and say the glory is here, but it really isn't. The anointing is here and there may be a measure of the light of God, but if the glory of God ever showed up in full measure, we'd all be dead. Mountains oh. melt at his manifest presence. How much more man's flesh? We have, we have failed to grasp something about the glory of God. Perhaps we are unable to grasp it. Paul the apostle said that no flesh should glory should glory in his presence. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 29. If there is flesh present when the glory of God comes, then it will have to be dead flesh because nothing can live in that presence. The only mortal thing that can remain in, in his manifest presence and stand is dead flesh because only dead men can see his face. Okay, I got three things. We got to get to a place that when we've truly allowed God to kill our flesh, we can really say, I'm really not alive anymore. It's not, it's not, because Christ is not I, he, he lives in us. So when we get to a place that we die, people will only see him. Y'all hear that, right? They will only hear him. That's why people can't justify how they talk. They can't justify things that they say and said, I just had a moment. No, because when you are truly a dead man or a woman, however you want to put it, then no flesh will rise. Only Christ will rise because he's what's supposed to be inside of us. So we got to stop justifying and just die to our flesh. The Bible says, uh, 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 you are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. So if we truly dead to our flesh, the old man should never rise up again. I'm just saying. The other part was, um, uh, da, 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 da. we don't understand the delicate matter of approaching the glory of God today. We talk about the glory and say the glory is here, but it really isn't. The anointing is here. That's the difference. And there may be a measure of the light of God, but if the glory of God ever showed up in full measure, we'd all be dead. Because think about it, when you look at a volcano, when it erupts, everything around it begins to melt. Have y'all ever noticed that? It burns through everything. That's what God wants to do in us. He wants to burn through everything that's not like him. Mm, 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 mm. Y'all get that. And then the last part says, we all be dead. Mountains melt and his at his at his manifest presence but much more man's flesh so when we allow god to do what he do that last part no flesh shall glory in his presence i said a year a few years back i said you know what holy spirit god can't move because flesh is moving up in there no flesh can glory in his presence when god see man trying to get the glory god is not gonna move because all he see is flesh Anybody want to comment on what she just read or what I just said? Because we're not going to go around the table. I tell you, we're not doing that anymore. Uh, good to see you, uh, Mother Mother Forbes, uh, Elder uh, Althea, grace and peace to you. Please give me a call. Come on, anybody want to comment on what was just said or read? So that that says to me, what that says to me is when we're in our worship service, when somebody is showing their flesh that could hinder God's presence yes. from being in the service. It can hinder God's presence when flesh wants to be the one that's being seen. That's why scripture says no flesh should glory can glory in his presence. How's God going to move if man don't get out the way? True. That's why sometimes when I'm listening to people preach, I, every now and then I hear Holy Spirit say, that's not me. That's only flesh. And I have to just start praying. Especially when I know God wants to move, but flesh wants to move too. Every People want to be seen. And I'm here to tell you, in this hour right here, people can try to be seen all they want. God gonna sit them down. Did I ask you a question, Precious? I'm so sorry. You, what, yep. else, what else you got? Anybody just want to comment on what was read or said? 
No? All right, then. Well, guess what? We are done for tonight. I'm going to stop the recording. When we come back next week, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to go to page 58, and we are still in Dead Men See His Face. I don't know if I'm coming back. Um, and uh, his mercy keeps him away from us. <laughs> We're going to cover all of that, but I just want to call those out. Okay? And forget the high entertainment. So many people trying to entertain. And God said, get out of the way and let me do what I do. Amen? Let me stop this. Mm -hmm. And then she can give us the announcements and